Tracia, welcome to Becoming the Channel. I'm so excited to be here. Long time listener, first time guest. I'm <laughs> so excited to have you here. For those of you who are just getting to know you, what's your best social media platform where you hang out so they can follow you yeah, as we're talking? I'm at Illuminate Family Workshop. It's the best place awesome. to find me and link in bio for all the goodies and Instagram, right? Are you on TikTok too, or just Insta? Not in, not uh, TikTok yet. Kind of right. going back and forth whether or not to, to dive I in think, there. I think you need to, but that's where all the cool kids are hanging out right? or something. I don't know. <laughs> anyway. All right. So we have Tracia on today and Tracia, just for kind of context, I'll have mentioned this already in the intro, but you have been part, you're actually one of the founding members of the Rising CEO Mastermind that I lead. And even before that, you worked privately with me as you were making the transition out of your traditional school speech and language pathology professional and into the wild, wild west of creating mm -hmm. your own business and calling in clients and all the things. So that's where we're going to head today as we talk, but I really want to start with this because I love to give our listeners an opportunity to get to know you. So when you were a little kid, what did you tell people you wanted to be when you grew up? If you asked little Tracia what she wanted to be, she would say, I want to be a teacher in this lifetime. And then she would go on to tell you all the things that she wanted to be in her next lifetimes. Like what? And like an artist, um, some kind of like big city maverick, businessy person, um, some kind of world traveler, some kind of cook or chef. Um, so I just thought when I was a kid, like you have to pick for now. I got so sad about having to pick now and I may or may not remember the next lifetimes. Not that anyone ever really told me that, um, but that's how I answered the question. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Well, in this lifetime, I'm going to be a teacher. And the next time I come back, I'll be able to do mm -hmm. these other things. So you have a list mm -hmm. of things that you want to do, all of which, of course, are aspects of who you are. Timeline jumping. Thanks to I that. Love that. Uh -huh. Timeline jumping. Yes. We're going to, we're going to talk about timeline jumping today. And then what, when you were a little kid, what were the things that made you realize that you were pretty different from other people? Intuitive hits, experiences that you had that were a little bit like, mm, I don't think other people think this way or see the world the way that I do. I think as a little kid, I was always just waiting for someone to tell me like, I, the one example that comes to mind is I wanted, I was waiting for my mom to tell me that we were like, I was a princess or like some kind of royalty. I'd be like, you can tell me now, like I'm old enough to know that I come from a lineage or I, I have these powers now, or there's like some kind of secret that is in that I, that needs to be opened up into and I know, I don't know it yet, but I already know that already. So you can just acknowledge that in me, um, I think was what I was waiting for. I just remember that feeling of waiting. Um, but I don't think it was until when I was a little kid, I did a lot of imaginary play and imaginary friends that I would run off to imaginary worlds. Um, and I didn't realize that not everybody does that um, as to the extent that I would do until later on and, and sharing those experiences with with peers so, so like what imaginary world would you go to and who would you go with um I would go into a secret garden um that's where I which looking at it now the Akashic records um and meeting looking at it now spirit guides but those were the people that would come in um and we would play and I would get you know, my sage advice that I needed at six years old from them. Um, and then I would go on quests um, as a little kid. I got so, chills when you said quests. <laughs> what was the quest that you went on? Um, like finding different, uh, like I would, I would be tasked with a quest to find like a special stone or 
um, a secret entrance to something um, when I would, I would just be playing out in nature and you'd find a secret pathway or something like that. So that was, <laughs> I thought everybody had those. Um, Not everybody. Those vivid mm -hmm. um, types of callings, I suppose. So you're the daughter of immigrants. You're first generation American. We talk a lot about wealth consciousness and the genetic, generational, societal, and cultural influences when it comes to attracting, receiving, and holding wealth on all levels, whether it's money or other forms of abundance. And I think that that's a, an important part of the conversation where you came from and waiting to be told, confirmed that you were royalty and talk us through a little bit about your experience of being a first generation kiddo in America. It has, that narrative has evolved into from, I don't, I, th I think burden might be too harsh of a word, but from a burden to a purpose in in starting my business and in stepping into uh, my mission, I think I've always had this. Um, I'm also the oldest child of two younger or oldest sister of two younger sisters, and so there's always this weight of responsibility that I felt that I had. Um, which you know, if we're looking at the narrative too, like you take care of your sisters, you know, do the things as older sisters do. And then a little bit more so um, with just how culturally that was um, what's expected. But it wasn't until um, we started working together and looking at not only the narratives from the, from more, I want to say like just ground level and looking at it pulling back that I was looking at how the narrative has shifted into a responsibility to heal generational trauma, transform um, the trajectory of my of my family. Um, and the responsibility that there is to anchor in light here your dad is chinese dad's chinese mom's filipino they moved here around like high school age or so um and yeah dad uh fled cultural revolution in china and um and mom fled a third world country I don't know if they would actually you know they growing up that's those weren't stories that I would hear um it was like a very we're here now so let's move on and and keep going and do what we got to do here um it's not something that was glamorized or a place that we needed to go back to or even so there's a lot of um just like gray area I want to say around what that really meant so that left me and as anyone would creating their own stories about what that means what was the story about money growing up from both of your parents perspective it was something that you have to sacrifice for that it only comes with back breaking um grit and that it comes at a cost of, um, you can't do what you love and have money. You have to choose either one and you're gonna have to choose safety above all things. Um, and this like squirreling away, if you do have it, and then if you do have it, other people might wanna try to take it. Um, from you, or you might be a target for other people poaching or taking advantage. Um, but also, it, it, there was also this, um, like, a sense of 
a sense of um, like keep it in the tribe when it came to that. So there was a lot of generosity, but it was also a very like, we don't talk about it. Um, it's something that you have or you don't. And um, the people who do have, there might be, there. there's no way that they're happy. There might be like some kind of hole in how they're navigating their life. And, you know, this whole, um, we might not have a lot of money, but at least we're happy kind of mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you're a little kid and you want to be a teacher and an artist and a business mogul and all the things. Mm -hmm. And then you've got this foundation of sacrifice. You've got a foundation of, you know, people picking up and leaving their home countries for safety reasons, for security reasons, for freedom reasons, for a better life. You land here, you grow up, and you're making decisions about your career. I'm going somewhere with this. What occurs to you yeah. with that kind of leapfrog? How did you make the decision to go into the field? And can you tell us a little bit about that process? Yeah, so um, the most um, sought after fields were, or the ones that you were kind of primed to take on were nursing or become a doctor or be a PA, something in the medical field, because then you would always have a job and it would always, you would, you would be safe and you would make decent money and you'd have long hours, but that doesn't matter because then you have a job. Um, and so I, teaching wasn't something that, um, would be, agreed upon or not agreed upon, but um, wouldn't be approved of too much. Um, but then I found out about um, speech language pathology, which was this beautiful blend of um, the hard sciences of medical stuff, and then also the creativity that flows into therapy. And getting to, I thought there was, I get to work in a school still, um, and impact children and their lives. And I thought this was going to be perfect. Um, and you just keep to, you know, the black and white, you follow the guidelines and you be a good girl and you, know, you get your, you get your A's and then you get your job and then you check all the boxes, you check all the boxes and you be happy and you just be happy with it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So how'd that work out? So you finish your, you go to undergrad, you get your master's degree and you go out into the world. And, and I, job. yeah, I get my first job. I did that thing after grad school where you moved to a new city without knowing a single soul and thought, this is where I will, this is where I'll land. The adventure awaits. I was standing in my like three by four office that I thought, oh my God, I get to do this. They're going to pay me. I have made it. And the dream job started to turn into golden handcuffs. Mm -hmm. um, so I stayed in there for about three, three years or so. What were um, the golden handcuffs about for you? You know, it was the dream job. This was something that I've been working for towards for such a long time. And I loved the, the criteria that was set and the, the job description that was written in about speech language pathologists and how they operated in schools, because it told me how to be a good girl. It told me, this is what you do. This is what you don't do. This is, um, don't go beyond this. And if you achieve this, then you get your gold star. And that was great until one, that's not achievable to get a gold star and acknowledgement from other people when you can't give that gold star to yourself. Um, and I had a larger vision for how I can support families and how things work. And I would start to question why thing, why we were doing things a certain way and um, how we could optimize systems and how we could really support our students. And I came to you three months after leaving 
my school job in the middle of the year um, because I could not, my skin was on fire being in there um, and seeing the ways that we were letting students fall through the cracks. We weren't able to support in ways and there just wasn't anything I could do that would truly make the big impact that I knew that I could make. So I stayed in that field, in that setting, I stayed in that setting thinking, it's fine, I'll just impact the ones that I have, I'm next to and just make this this little impact and that's all that will, you know, that, that'll that matter and we'll call it a day and, um, but that wasn't enough. It wasn't enough. You went through COVID, right, at the schools? Yes. Mm-hmm. Became a teletherapist saw kids mm-hmm. online, um, saw the ways that schools were not equipped to support students in their social emotional development. And in the middle of the year, one day you just woke up and said. Plotted a little bit. I plotted a little bit. Just in, I knew just enough that I knew I had to make a move. I did not realize what I was doing to the extent. Because if I think I, if I knew what I know now, I'd be hiding under my bed. <laughs> I don't think I, I would have been paralyzed. So it was a very simple, like, oh, I know, I'll just start my practice and I'll just, you know, pick up a kids. And I, I saw some other people do it. And I thought that the only thing different that I'm going to be doing, that's going to be so innovative, is that I'm not going to take insurance and I'll do private pay and I'll use um, the government funded homeschooling type of fund. And people will have that option. I'll provide, you know, insurance reimbursement. And that'll be the crazy thing that I'm doing in my business. <laughs> and you're laughing because? I'm laughing because it is so much bigger than that. Um, I, as I started to, um, build my practice, meet my clients, I started creating the only thing that I knew, which was you work with families in this kind of way. And these are how many times a week, these are the amount of minutes. This is the amount that you can support them in these specific ways. And I was recreating the golden handcuffs all over again. Um, and that's not why I left. So rather than breaking the mold, which is what you left to do, to challenge the status quo, to be creative, to drop, to allow your vision to drop in. There was that reaction of this, probably a stress reaction actually, which often will happen when you leave and you go back to the familiar and you just you create a carbon copy of where you came from. Until one day, until one day, I mean, I knew there was, there's something more, there's something more. I just know it. Um, I, I actually am somewhere that I didn't anticipate to be. And someone said, I have a good, I have a connection for you if you want it. And that was you. And here we are a year. How long has it been a, a year ish? Something like that. Yeah. yeah. Well, I always think about, you know, in self magazine, they have the before and after pictures of people who have lost weight and it can be super inspiring, but when it comes to business transformation, wealth consciousness transformation, it's like people can kind of get the, this is where I was before. And this is where I was after, but I know that our listeners love to hear the story of the in-between space, the, what was happening at the beginning And then what did you have to go through to get on the other side? Because where you are now is very different. It's a very different place than where you were a year and a half ago. So. Unrecognizable. Unrecognizable. And we're still in the middle too. Like this will be my middle point at some point. But I think um, to your point before hopping on this call, getting to, I have a beautiful tendency of, continuing to look at the next thing and the next thing and let's just keep going and not taking a pause and a moment to actually let everything that has come into fruition um, integrate 
So you started working one-on-one -on -one with me. And I remember, of course, everyone knows if you've listened to me at all, I talk about the NEO all the time. So I think that's where we started with you, with the NEO. And y'all, like Drea Brown from a couple of weeks ago, Tracia has one of the highest openness scores on the planet. I think you're three standard deviations above average in a room of 10,000 people in a football stadium. You're probably going to be the most open, most imaginative, most likely to rock the boat, most likely to be hyper empathic, feel other people's feelings and emotions, most likely to love learning more than anything else, right? And maybe a little bit more neurodiverse than you had originally thought as well. Yeah, that ADHD uh, realization came to came to the came into the picture. Um, How did that change we, things for you? Working together, when you it, realized that ADHD was part of the conversation we had to have about you and your business. He's so many pieces together, and I believe that it has given me the permission and grace to stop fighting my brain. Mm -hmm. um, you were educating and sharing so much about ADHD um, during that segment of time too. And all of the ways that I kept saying, that's me, that's me. Um, it just made everything make sense. Um, and it made me appreciate myself in a way that I've been just beating my help, my head up against a wall wondering, yeah. yeah, why am I not like everyone else? Is it, well, this? is it that? And for context at the time, I got really transparent about my own ADHD and the connection between ADHD and spiritual intelligence and intuition. And it was something that I made a specific decision to come forward with and to be more public in the conversation about, because I think it is a missing link for a lot of us that are high achievers and who have great brains in our heads, but there's also something else going on, the twice exceptional people among us. And there was a little bit of debate, I remember at the time in my circles around, you know, do you how important it is, is it to get a diagnosis of ADHD and how important it actually it doesn't matter that much, especially remember at the time how like diagnoses for ADHD among adult humans was like at an all time high, probably because in part, because everyone had no other time to do it in their lives, except during COVID is to identify like what's wrong with their brains. So the decision that I made to come forward and start talking about ADHD, not as necessarily a superpower at all, but as something that a lot of creatively and spiritually gifted people have to deal with is in some ways meant to be affirming that it is something that you have to address and honor in yourself, I think. And foundationally, if you stop making yourself wrong about how your brain works, things shift pretty quickly, I think, in business and in life. Yeah. Really. Um, feeling so seen by you mm -hmm. in our conversations about ADHD and then going to turn to my clients. And I primarily work with kids with ADHD mm -hmm. and being able to be that person for them too. Um, acknowledging it in myself allowed me to acknowledge it in them and for them to acknowledge it in me and have that connection. How did that change things? Oh, it totally shifted the shape of my business. I know that, um, I mean, when you work in the schools where a bulk of my training was, you kind of just work with whoever walks through the door, right? So you have a huge range of, um, of, diagnoses that you work with. Um, and I always gravitated towards this cohort of students. I mean, I didn't like the accommodations that, or the things where they were sharing, like, you know, student doesn't sit in seat. I'm like, I don't sit in a seat like everybody else either. So whatever. Um, but it shifted in the way that I was able to talk about the way, the, the ways that I have been able to deploy and you've used that word when talking about ADHD, your intellect to cover up for 
areas that you're struggling in and allow me to see that masking, allow me to see that masking in my other students and speak to them directly about the ways that they're doing that and speak to the exhaustion around that and the, hey, let me hold your hand. Let's do this together piece in it for them. I remember I refer to this as parallel play when two people are working together side by side. We don't talk, we just work together. And you came up with a new phrase for that. Well, that was one of my students who actually did that. We were talking about parallel play and I was like, let's make it your own because that's the best way to make something your own and let a strategy really stick is if you can rename it yourself. And we came up with double bubble. The double bubble. Let's go double Double bubble. And that has become something that you do with all of your students, I think as well, that you work with is to teach them that that methodology. So we've talked a lot about your own process. We've talked a, and about how it's shifted, how you approach your clients. Let's shift into business. Because this is wealth consciousness. And I mean, you and I, as clinician, as clinicians, as people who care very much about people's health and well-being, can talk shop for hours. But let's shift the conversation and bring the businesses into it because this is really the rising CEO mastermind. All of the work that you've been doing is really about business, creating business and rising into the true CEO and stepping away from or saying goodbye to the technician practitioner that you were in the schools. What was that transition like as you've made that? jump from practitioner to CEO? You know, what comes to mind with this is just the deep gratitude that I have for the containers that not only Rising CEO has created, but our one-on-one, just that space, because it is so scary to go go from technician and that's where you feel safe. Um, And even just hearing the ways that other people run their businesses, knowing like, I don't know if I want to do that, but you just, you can double bubble with them and you just tap into that. Let's just use grit to push Mm -hmm. through and, you know, the way that they treat money and, um, and think that that's, well, if I'm going to own a business, I have to think like them. I have, so I might, I might as well just start tapping into what they're doing and push that way too. And I don't, you can see how, like, I would be able to see like, okay, well, that's not it, but like, that's the only thing I know. And then hearing about how there's knowing that there's another way of doing it, but then doing it in community Mm -hmm. has been, I mean, the linking arms piece of it. It's not, I mean, I don't think I want to use the word like safe place, but it's the, you know, we're all on a mission here. Um, and it's bigger than, than just what I can even comprehend and that coming together piece of it, um, really just amplifies that and, and zooms out how important this, why we're doing what we're doing, because holy crap, have I tried to quit multiple times. (laughs) What stops you from quitting? Oh. I get all, like, I will, I, in the almost two years that this business has opened, I have tried so many times and what stopped me is it's, it's more than I can even, I can't even put a finger on it. It's the knowing that's the purpose. It's It's your vision too. Vision. I remember when you came in, you had the vision of Illuminate Family Workshops and the big kitchen table and the people coming together in community and having this, yeah, just this community of people who care about each other, connect with each other and are transformed in their, how they're functioning in the world. And I could see it. And I always know that the people who come into my world have visions and my job is just to believe you. And it was easy to believe because I could see it myself. And I remember 
I want to go back to your family history, because when we talk about becoming the channel, there are a lot of different layers to this. There's the business energetics, there's the personal energetics, and then we have your grandmother. Do you remember that day that your grandmother came in to your session? And she was like, I have not come this far for you to stop. Like we didn't do all this for you to just like be average. I know I just probably butchered what she actually said, but that was kind of the message that came through. And so even the encouragement from the ancestors for you has been something I think that has propelled you into where you are now in business. Absolutely. To be so held by that. I think we can so easily, the delusion, right? Is that we're doing this on our own. No one's going to help me. I have to muscle through that Mm -hmm. whole illusion. Um, and so to, to know how, how held and how supported I truly am across timelines, across timelines, current one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What do you think about when you, Let's talk about finances, because I think that was the thing that prompted our conversation today was people will come into business and one of their first goals is I want to replace my salary with revenue from my business. And whether or not they say that, that's that's sort of a, a given. And it's something that I love to focus on people is replacing salary with income from your business as fast as possible. So that prompted our meeting today, this, this podcast today, because we were talking about that and I was checking in with you. Where are you with that? Where did you start and where you are now? So, so I started, um, around 4,500 a month, um, in the schools, believing that, well, I chose a field that I like. So that means that I, this is the max I will be able to make. And this is all I'm allowed really that word allowed was um what was there i would see other friends in court like oh you can climb corporate ladders no no i chose something where this is as much as i'm allowed and because i love it that's it um and how wrong i was and i believed there were so many scripts around like well you're being greedy how do i how do i price things and it's never about how how do i price things it's it's not um what is it about and the I have something of value. What I do is so valuable to the families that are that I'm here to work with and to impact and connect with. And it's saying that it's betting on myself. That piece of it that is more than you know, getting tossed up around like, well, should I, should I price it with nine, seven at the end of it? Or should I price it with zeros? What's something that like, what is the reason say about, I remember Googling that, like, if I put like, should I end my numbers in five or should I make it like angel numbers? How should I, how should I price things? Um, and getting caught up in, in all of those little pieces. Um, when I was really flipping out over stepping into my gifts and how, you know, what I do, how I work with kids really matters. And not everyone can do it the way that I do it. And saying that, because if I say that, then does that mean that someone else isn't good? Because I don't want to say that anyone else isn't good. You know, it's that like that whole cycle. Um, anyway, so that's how much I was making in the schools. And then nowadays, um, I'm around 6K a month. So we replaced the old salary and we're growing. We are growing. And what was that like to look at and to realize that that's what's actually happened for you and your business? Mm-hmm. Honestly, I don't think I'd look at it unless you said, hey, Tricia, let's look at this together <laughs> right now. Let's look money um, in the eyes because money oh, loves money loves to be acknowledged. Oh, it's so crunchy. It was so crunchy. Because um, even when I think 
I'm doing well. I don't want to say that. I don't want to, um, I think the piece of me that is holding a really, really big vision is like, we got to keep going. We got to, you know, we, we've got more to do. We got things to, we got things to create, um, a physical space to, to plant and to root and ground in, in like, we gotta, we gotta keep moving. Um, but it, things have shifted so much looking money in the eye. And actually being able to let that land. It's not this thing that you have to, that I have to be fearful of. Um, and it's also, yeah, that's where I'm going with that. <laughs> I want to talk about your new car and listen, listen. Listen, listeners, cars to me represent how you get around in the world. And there's this interesting thing that I've noticed in the rising CEOs that come into my world is that y'all somehow show up rolling up in new cars. I. What is that for you? It was such a symbol. Oh, there was so much crunchiness around the car. Um, the car that I was driving around, that I was making, was going around in the world, still had my New York license plates. It was the car that I used to drive across the country twice. Um, it was my, my the thing that, and the narratives around cars too, were like, well, you don't want a car payment and like they're, you know, all that, that stuff. And my parents were, um, are people who get a car and like, they'll drive that 2020 Toyota Camry until, or sorry, that 20, 2000 Toyota Camry until the year 2020. Um, so you just pick one and you, you stick with it. And um, there were some shifts happening in December around my business, around visibility, around um, who I was calling in, who I was working with. And, you know, we were talking about like what it means to embody that CEO um, embody the CEO and, and to be, to be, uh, and, and in connection with my business and the consciousness of my business and how it wants to support me. And it wants to, to be, to provide and create these opportunities. And around December, I got into a little fender bender, which this is the long story of it, but, um, and I, I think it should have been just, you know, fixed or whatever, but, um, it was time for me. That was, that was its way. It was time for me to get a new car and, uh, I didn't want to let it go at all. Um, and it was, it wasn't about the car. It was about the embodying of how I get around in this world and what's my first impression to myself. Um, cause you know, yeah, that's what, that's what that car was. And now mm -hmm. I'm rolling around in a 20. 21 infinity <laughs> love that love that for you it's very fancy well I mean part of it too is you are do you think you're gen z or millennial I know you're gen x in your soul but yeah I was about to know. say say more millennial yeah but I mean it's kind of a rite of passage right going from college girl car to ceo yeah, I used to car. do hour long commutes in that mm -hmm. thing. I didn't want to yeah. let her go. No, I know. I get it. I drove my mm -hmm. Volkswagen Beetle convertible that I got on my first day of internship for my PhD in 2006. I drove that literally into the ground. Like it would not go any further. <sighs> I love that so car. Like I that. love I that car. It's... But, you know, then at some point it's like, you've got to, you've got to make the shift into something else that is well, much more suited for who you are becoming and yeah. say goodbye to that version of yourself, the good girl, the good student, the one who capped her salary because it's a thing that she chose made your bed, you lie in at that kind of energy mm -hmm. into this expansiveness, which is much more in alignment 
with who you are energetically, spiritually, psychologically. Absolutely. Making that outside match the inside. I think so much had shifted up until that point where I was just, it, it was time. I mean, even like something as trivial as like wardrobe, I mean, not trivial, but that too. Mm -hmm. I was, I don't know who I am anymore. So much is going on. Um, and letting, letting things shift. Well, I remember too, when you and John were, I, I, I don't remember if you guys moved, but I remember you had, you were trying to work out of a, be, a spare bedroom oh, or something. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. We had a guest bedroom that like no one came to visit. We just needed, <laughs> they're like, no, no, I can't take the bed away because what if someone comes to visit, which <laughs> um, I'll just, you know, pull up this tiny little table and we'll just shove it in the little corner. Uh, no, I mean, yeah, the symbolism of taking up space. And then taking up space. Taking up space, literally. All right. So a couple of things. One thing I wanted to come back to is at the beginning of your transition out of the schools and into your own business, one of the things that you did wisely, I think, is to get information on the how-to, the strategy around how to create a speech and speech language pathology practice, like all of those things. What did you realize at the end of getting all of that information in terms of what you needed to do next? Um, yeah, when I first made that jump, I joined a course on how to start a, how to get your LLC and how to, you know, do all the little logistics of that, how to set up a business bank account and all well and good. Those are the how to's. Um, but it was bigger than, and I, I'm someone who, you know, like I'm smart. I will figure it out myself. Um, but I, uh, the current me was guiding the past me saying, you, you need, this is bigger than. How is something like that, like a course like that different from your experience in the work that you've done here in Rising CEO? Rising CEO has been about the the mission and the energetics. I have, <laughs> I don't think I've told you this. I have been like, I need you to just, you know, you want someone to be, to just tell you the answers to everything. And that's not what it's about. Because if you wanted that, and if you were going towards that, you, that course would have been just fine. The how-to would have been just fine. You would have just followed suit, followed the numbered checklist and check off more boxes. Yeah. And, and that would be okay. You would be content. But if, if you're not content, there's something more, there's something yeah, more there. I find that it's seldom a lack of information that keeps people from receiving the success that they desire in their business. Information is everywhere. But I think it's what I've learned as I started the rising CEO mastermind and have, you know, developed my own business over I'm 10 years in business. I can't even believe it now, but you know, is how, how important the energetics of business are understanding your own energy, understanding your relationship with money and shifting it so that it's a healthy one since it touches every aspect of your life. And then learning how to ex express and embody your version of leadership, what it means to be a leader. Absolutely. I, um, I preach that to my clients that you, sometimes you're too close to it mm -hmm. and there's going to be days. There are been days where I have the vision, but it's just lost in the weeds and I need someone mm -hmm. else to be like, Hey, come on, come on in, come on up to your vision. Come on up. Cause your yeah. vision's not sinking down to that. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And old you version know, of yourself speaks through you it speaks through the my trusted inner circle mm -hmm. and I need to stay connected to that um truly so good one of the things I love about what you've created with your business is it really is a a hybrid of the things that you are so masterful at the working with the nonverbal kids and the neurodiverse kids for sure. Um, 
but then also the consultations that you've been doing in the more corporate space. So cool opportunities have come your way and we won't disclose, we won't name names until everything is, until the eagle has landed, but there's just so many opportunities that have shown up just as a result, I think of who you're being. There's none of that, you know, oh, shucks, I'm just a little girl. I'm just, you know, I'm so young and I don't know enough or I need more experience or whatever and really standing in your power as a leader My in gosh. your field. Truly, I think that in these helping fields, we talk all the time about let's make it multidisciplinary and like um, want let's integrate, but there's, it's, it's all just talk and I haven't actually seen a model of that being done um, until, so I was like, we've, we've got to create it then. Mm -hmm. um, and it feels crunchy at times because of the way that I'm going rogue from the medical model, but I've been trained by it. So I'm, you know, acknowledging where my lens is there as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, when you're talking about letting these opportunities come in and, and letting these corporations contact me, um, and being able to, to, I don't know, I don't know if the words traverse there, um, between those two worlds and letting, sharing my expertise and, and knowledge about this because it doesn't help if you know I tell my kids and like when I used to have a speech room like it, it doesn't matter if you know how to do this in this tiny room with me you've got to do it everywhere else um, it's got to generalize into your classroom and with your peers and with your friends and with your parents um, so it's just that in a in a larger scale yeah and directed at the business and the work that you're here to do. What's your favorite thing about the person you've become in this process? Oh, that's a good question. My favorite thing is the, the aliveness, the awakeness, the sovereignty that I have, that I, I'm realizing that I have and always have had over my life. Um, and the play that comes along with opening into spiritual gifts. It's so fun. <laughs> Couldn't imagine doing it another way. Well, and it's unique to who you are. It's specific to who you are. And that's the joy of, of doing this work and having this world that I live in is that the open, creative, intuitive, highly educated professional people come in. And I think you're all from the future. And I think you're all bringing business from the future into the present. Mm. That's what I actually think is happening. I mean, the way that you start off our one-on-one -on -one calls are, what are you creating today? Yeah. Like what, what are you creating today? And it's, just that question alone. I, I love the, <laughs> the sound of that. It's so much better than that. what, like, what's the problem? What problem right? are we solving today? Like that's so <laughs> like, I mean, the if it's a, it, that that open. Uh, it's like, it's so much more fun to look at what's possible from a freedom perspective than to, you know, focus on the problems. And that's one of the reasons I left my job as a psychologist, I said one time, if I, if one more sorority girl tells me that her boyfriend cheated on her and they broke up, I'm going to lose my mind. Like I can't even do this one more time because there's so much more that's possible. And I think that what you're doing with your field as an innovator, I think what you're doing for the next generation of leaders in terms of showing them through your actions, how to lead well, how to lead yourself well, 
how to make money, how to hold money, how to navigate life. I think these are all gifts and I can't wait to see what you create next. Me too. I'm, I'm excited. This is the possibilities that what you can manifest and create are endless. And if there's somebody listening who has, is thinking about, I want to make the leap out of my therapy practice. I want to make the leap out of my whatever clinical practice. And I want to be like Tracia. Come join us. I know you're <laughs> out there. There's, you know, we're, we're supposed to do this together. I would love for them to, to reach out and connect with me. Cause I want to, I want to hear about the big dream that's on their heart. I think that's how I emailed you. I said, I don't know what's going on. I just know I have a big dream in my heart. Please help me. Yeah. Um, and I want to hear about it. And then we can, I want to be able, I want to be there to, to cheer you on in that and share where I've been. Like, I know there's going to be points where I'm like, yep, yeah, totally. You hit that milestone. Cause you've done that to me so many times, mm -hmm. whether it be your first client or a client that you thought was going to work with and it didn't work out. It's okay, cool. Mm -hmm. Let's yeah. That happens. That's that happens. part of and it's business. Just, it's part of the great video game we're living in. So mm -hmm. we may as well enjoy it. And it's always good to have somebody who can see around the corners and who knows that level pretty well and has mastered the level and then Got knows you. the knows the cheat codes and and believes not just in you, but believes you. And I know that you do that for your people as well. Tracia, thank you so much for joining us today. It was just a joy to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. And I will see everybody next time. <laughs>